So, guys, this is going to be an update for my Soul Eater build, which is a Necromancer tank build. Um, and its main aim is for, like I've said, four-man content, dungeons, arenas. It really helps in pickup groups if you use a lot of random dungeons, if you're doing pledges with random groups. It's going to really help you get through that content, and it provides a lot of buffs to yourself that are going to help you to drag your group through content if that's the case, if you need to do that. If you're in a good group, it's also going to benefit those types of people because they're going to be able to do more ultimates. So this is going to be a really, really nice ulti-gen necro tank build, and we're calling it a soul eater. And the main function of that is because we consume the souls to gain more ultimate. So we'll start off with um, the, the character sheet. So we've got a nice balance of magicka health and stamina. Uh, we've gone with 8 points there, 27 into health, 29 into stamina. That gives us a nice... Almost 21k Magicka, 37.7 health, and 20, ne nearly 28k stamina, so that's okay. Magicka recovery is on the low side, but we are going to get more when we proc things inside combat. And our resistance is 20k if we buff up a little bit more. So 26.4k. Now, resistances are not as important anymore. So since the Wake in Flame patch, resistances are less valuable because when we're blocking... We're gaining lots and lots of damage reduction. We don't need as much resistances anymore. 26k is more than enough for dungeon content. So we're not worrying about trying to push it any higher. Um, Atronach Mundestone, because we need more Magicka Recovery. We're going to be casting a lot of Magicka Skills. So that's what we need. The Witch Sugar Skulls on the food, because we need all resources. And then for things like potions, you're just going to use your regular Tristat potions. In terms of the race... I have chose to go with Red Guard. Now, my primary reason for this is sustain. So, because the Necro can be kind of difficult in terms of sustain, I have gone with Red Guard. However, this is an ulti gen build. So, what you could do is you could use a Nord because Nords gain more ultimate back. You could also be a Imperial because Imperials have reduced cost of ultimate. So, those are both good options as well. I've gone down the route of Red Guard because there's no point having extra ultimate if you can't sustain your stamina skills to be able to maintain your actual tanking. So that's my reason for that. Um, but the main function of this, so martial training reduce the cost of weapon abilities by 8%. So heroic slash, your taunt, your blockade, all those skills are going to get reduced in cost, which is really nice. So yeah, as I said, reduce cost of weapon abilities by 8%. So it helps us with some sustain. Conditioning, increase max stamina by 2,000, so max stam is very important. We want more max stam because the more stamina we have, the longer period of time we have before we start to run out. So we want to have a little bit more max stam if we can, and that's really nice. And then the main reason why we've chose Red Guard, this is a huge, huge passive adrenaline rush. When you deal damage, you restore 1,005 stamina. This effect can occur once every 5 seconds. So you put down Blockade. Every time Blockade ticks, you're going to get 1,005 stamina every 5 seconds. That is over 12k stamina a minute. So, sustain doesn't really... It's not really an issue because you've got so much incoming stamina. 12,000 stamina per minute. As long as you just keep Blockade down on the ground, that's a magical skill. And then Adrenaline Rush is just going to proc every 5 seconds. And so you're just going to constantly be getting stamina back. So that's going to be really, really helpful. When you tie this in with other stamina gain as well, from like when you combine it with the constitution passive, obviously that's more resources. That's every four seconds. So when you deal damage, you're going to gain every five seconds. And every, when you take damage, every four seconds, you're also going to gain that. So lots and lots of incoming stamina from various different sources. Right, the gear. This is the juicy stuff. So first gear set is going to be Drake's Rush. And obviously we've gone with a decisive weapon because this is an ulti gem build. So we've got a decisive one-hander on the front bar with a tri-stat enchant for more resources. So we're going to get health, magic, and stamina every time this procs. We've got a Drake's Rush shield as well. Uh, that is a sturdy tri-stat. Then we're looking at the ice staff of the potentates, which has got an infused crusher. The reason for this gear set is the reduced cost of your ultimate by 15%. It's a three-piece gear set. So we've got that on the back bar. Because we're going to be mainly using our back bar ultimate. When we get to the monster set, we're using Arcasis on the monster set. Uh, that's because we want to have 
a five, we need two five pieces, we need a three piece gear set. We've also got a mythic item, so to try and make all this work, we're squeezing our cases onto the monster set. We've got Drake's Rush on some of the body pieces, our cases on some others. We've then got Pearls of El Nefe on the neck, and then our cases rings. So, if we just look, it's all in sturdy tri stat. Okay? With our cases, uh, we're going to get max health, we're going to get resistances, more max health. Whenever you drink a potion while in combat, you and your three group members gain 44 ultimate every 30 seconds. So what we've tried to do with our cases is then use two jewellery pieces. So one ring of the potentates, one our cases ring. Those are both, one of them is infused with potion cooldown, one of them is not infused. So one of them is triune with potion cooldown and the third one is infused magic recovery. And the reason why is because we don't want to go less than 30 seconds. Because if we're able to use a potion every 29 seconds, it's going to be a huge problem. Because then we're going to be procking our potion too early. And then we can't use the set on cooldown. So we're trying to get it close to 30 seconds, but a few seconds more than 30. So that we've got time to make sure we can guarantee to get the Arcasis proc with the potion use at the same time. The Pearls of Elmafe are there because whenever you cast a healing ability while in combat... Uh, your and your dominant resource is under 30%, you gain 5 ultimate. And we're going to get lots of ultimate from that as well. The other gear set was obviously Drake's Rush. We're going to get max health, max stamina, max stamina. So we're getting lots of stamina, lots of resources from this, which is really nice. And then when you bash an enemy, units of 3 group members within 50 meters gain major heroism. So we've got lots of ult gain here. We've got major heroism. We've got the Arcasis ultimate. We've got Pearls of Elnafe. We've got the reduced cost of ultimate with the potentate's uh, three piece. Reduced cost of ultimate by 15%. And then when we go on to our skills now, we've got even more ulti gain. So if we look at our bar, first of all, pierce armor, which is our main taunt, you've got to use it. It's a massive skill that provides minor breach, major breach. It's our taunt. It's our main skill. It's very cheap to use as well. 1066 stamina. Very important. Then we've got Heroic Slash. Now, we're not using this for anything other than the minor heroism. So you want to maintain this 100% of the time. And you just hit the enemy with it. You've got your major heroism going, minor heroism going. You've got lots and lots of stacked ultimate. You've got your decisive weapon that's procking. There's just so much ulti gain. We've then got Stalking Blast Bones. So we're using Stalking Blast Bones, guys. And this is 2,700, and 2700 magicka cost. Now, the main function of this is it creates a corpse on death. We're not using it for anything else. And the reason for this is because, like, in a boss fight, there might be very few corpses that you can consume. And we want to be consuming as many corpses as possible because we want to be procking... We want to be using necrotic potency to gain ultimate back. So we've got all of the sources of gain of ultimate coming in, but then we've also got necrotic potency. So when we go into an ad pull, this is amazing. You walk in, you sap all the um, energy from the corpses, you gain loads of ultimate. When you're not in a situation where there's loads of corpses, you create your own. So you just spam Blast Bones on the enemy. When you've got the Magicka free to do so, you just keep casting it and casting it and casting it, and that will get lots and lots of ultimate. Your main heal is Hungry Scythe. Um, this, the more enemies that are there, the bigger the heal is going to be. It scales on max health, so it's a good heal, and it's a really good heal the more people that you've got nearby. Um, for the front bar ultimate, you could use Barrier for the extra, extra magic recovery, but I've gone with Renewing Animation, and the reason why is because we're going to be gaining so much ultimate, combined with the fact that we're using this build to try and get through uh, pickup groups, random dungeons, hard content, all that difficult stuff. Um, maybe with random groups that are not hitting the highest damage, people might be dying. In that case, we've got this skill that is going to bring people back to life. So if you need it, if your group's dead, it's not going to be the end of it. We can just throw this down, bring everyone back to life. This is only to be used in emergency situations, but it's also got some passive benefits by having it slotted. When you're lower on health, you're going to get more healing back when you cast Hungry Sight. So really nice. Okay, uh, back bar skills in a rage. Uh, range taunt. You need a range taunt really for pretty much all content. Um, you don't want to be using something like Frost Clench. You don't want to use Frost Clench in dungeon content. Uh, the reason why is because when you use Frost Clench, you actually immobilize the enemies away from you. So you don't want to use it. You could switch it out on a boss fight and use Frost Clench instead. But in terms of dungeon content, Inner Rage is far superior because you want to range taunt enemies, but you don't want to 
leave them stuck around the room, frozen to the ground, because that's what happens. Frost Clench is an immobilization skill, and that's not exactly very useful when you're trying to bring enemies to you. You don't want them to then be frozen really far away. So we don't want to use... Uh, we don't want to use Frost Clench, we want to use Inner Rage for that reason. And it's got a 28 meter range instead of 15 meters on Frost Clench. So that's why we are using Inner Rage. We've then got Spirit Guardian. There's a couple of reasons for this. It's another little heal. It heals people in our group, which is nice. It consumes some damage. 10% of the damage you take is transferred to the Spirit. That's really nice. It's a 16 second duration. But if you cast this after 8 seconds, it creates a corpse. So as we mentioned before with Blast Bones, if you've got loads of spare magicka, you spam blast bombs, and you consume the corpses with necrotic potency. Now, if we're using Spirit Guardian as well, we're getting some benefits from having that. We also get a passive uh, 200 magicka recovery, which is really, really vital. Uh, but we're able to consume the corpse from this as well. So it's another corpse skill. We want to create as many corpses as we can to consume them to get more ultimate back. Right, next skill, Blockade of Frost. It's going to keep up our Crusher. It's going to keep procking our passive to give us stamina back. So we need to have this down all the time. It reduces the armor of the bosses mainly is the reason why we're using it. But uh, we do get like a projectile shield as well. We do get some nice little perks from having that on the bar. And we're using Ice Staff obviously because Ice Staff is a tank weapon. Uh, and that's really good. Summoner's Armor. So you can use either morph. Um, there's, there's two ways to run this. So you can run Summoner's Armor. And what this does is it gives you Major Resolve. And then it reduces the cost of Blast Bones, Mage, and Spirit Mender by 15%. So you can use this with Silver Leash, or you use the other morph, uh, and then you use Empowering Grasp. So which, whichever way you want to play it, you can use Silver Leash instead of Empowering Grasp, and then use the other morph instead of Summoner's Armor. So use Bone, use Bone Armor, use the morph that chains enemies in. The only problem with um, the other morph of this skill is it takes 3 seconds for it to chain a new enemy. So the only way to really do it is to range taunt everything and then spam cast the skill to then reset the cooldown. Because if you recast this skill, it will reset the cooldown on the chain. So you can chain an enemy every one second as long as you have aggro of the enemy. So you have to have aggro and then it will just chain them in. Um, you just keep spamming it. But it is kind of expensive, 2700 Magicka. Um, you're going to have a rough time. So. It really depends which way you want to play. You can play Summoner Armor, you can play the other morph, and then you can kind of use Silver Leash instead, or Empowering Grasp. So the reason why you'd use Empowering Grasp is because it's nice to have a immobilization skill. So when you pull an enemy in, ideally you want to immobilize them. Um, you could use a Fear skill, uh, so bone, like Totem. You could use Totem. However, Fears don't work on chained enemies. So if you've just chained an enemy in, you can't fear it. So there's kind of a bit of a problem with trying to do that. I personally prefer to pull enemies in and then immobilize them because that is possible to do that. Um, so with this skill, it's going to also provide another group buff. So you're going to get Empower for your allies and it's going to buff your Spirit Mender by 40% as well. So it's kind of nice. Um, it's a good skill to have. So just whichever way you want to play this, it's kind of up to you depending on which morph you want to take of Bone Armor. Take either morph of Bone Armor, depending on which one you take, either use Empowering Grasp or Silver Leash. And then the final skill is the Glacial Colossus. Now this has got a stun kind of part to this, so a lot of people like to use the other morph. I actually want to use it for the stun, so I would like to chain the enemies in, and then drop the Colossus to kill them all really fast, and then consume all the corpses. So it's really, really nice. Um, it provides major vulnerability, um, increasing the damage that the enemy takes by 10%. It has quite a big impact on in terms of the amount of damage a group can do. <clears throat> And with this setup, you're going to be able to drop this so often. So it's 191 ultimate in our current setup on the back bar. Uh, this is this is going to be huge. So we're going to be able to drop this as often as possible. Um, and that's, that's the whole point. Is we're trying to generate as much ultimate as we can, as fast as we can, so that we can get Colossus back as fast as we can. So we can drop that on every ad pull, every boss, multiple times on bosses. And then we're able to get it back again and keep recasting it. And then in an emergency situation, you'd potentially use Renewing Animation. Um, Champion points. Obviously, the green CP is up to you, but generally you can use Rationer, Liquid Efficiency, Steed's Blessing, Treasure Hunter. And then you just take everything that's not a slottable. Blue CP, same thing. Take everything that's not a slottable. And then your main ones are Duelist Rebuff, Enduring Resolve, Unassailable, and Ironclad. Now, if you know for certain that you're not going to take 
any AoE damage, then you could use Bulwark instead. In terms of dungeon content, you could also slot this, um, Enlivening Overflow. So we'd get 104 recovery for 6 seconds every 12 seconds. So it's a 50% uptime. So it's not amazing, but it is something that you can provide um, into a group if you wanted to. Uh, with that, you do have to overheal somebody in your group, though. You, you would only get that for yourself unless you overheal someone in your group. So it's really up to you. If you're going to put on a skill that can heal other people, then that might be quite good. In terms of the red CP, I like to use, well, you take everything that's not a slottable again. And then in terms of the slottables, obviously, we're taking Bracing Anchor. It's not as strong as it was. It did get a little nerf a few weeks ago, but Bracing Anchor is going to increase the amount of damage you can block. 20% uh, more block mitigation. If we then have a look at the top there, we've got Sustained by Suffering, 150 Health, Magic and Stamina Recovery, while under the effects of a negative effect. Now, negative effects are not the same as status effects. People get a little bit confused with Sustained by Suffering. You can get a negative effect just by attacking an enemy and an enemy attacking you. It's quite easy to actually proc this. It's easier than it reads. So, this is far better than Rejuvenation. Um, this, this is the best one to go with now, 150 Recovery, but it's only in combat. Uh, Expert Evasion, free dodge roll every 30 seconds. Obviously, I like to dodge roll a lot. It's going to be great for your sustain if you cast a dodge roll every 30 seconds, avoid some damage, and then it's a free dodge roll. So you can't really you can't really complain about that. That's a good one to have to help with sustain. Uh, celerity, increased movement speed. That's to kind of negate the 16% uh, movement speed reduction we've got with Brace and Anchor. We're going to get 10% more with Celerity. Now, you don't have to use that if you don't want to. You could use... A number of different options as well. So you could use Slippery. You could use Boundless Vitality if you want a bit more health. Um, if you really, really want to have more armor, then obviously Fortified. But it's not necessary. You don't need any more resistances than what we've got already. And I don't think there's anything else that's really worth taking for the Necro. Apart from those ones. So that is the champion points. Uh, we're going to do a little test on... Gaining our Colossus and dropping it again and see how fast we can kind of do that. So in a situation where you don't need... Um, let's say you're not going to use Empowering Grasp as well. You could switch out and put on another skill. Like Skeletal Mage. So you can you can kind of customise your skills a little bit depending on the situation. Like if you're in a boss fight, maybe you group are like a really spread out. Empowering Grasp is not going to be much useful. So... We're going to see how fast we can generate ultimate back on this boss. So, precast everything, precast all corpse abilities. And then as we go in. We can recast that. We can recast that. Put it back already. So as you can see... Like, we're able to get it back super fast. Like, I'm not even... This isn't even, like, me doing a really good rotation because skills are dropping off. And as I say, you can recast the skills early. We're just able to get it back super, super fast. So, the main benefit of this is the fact that we can obviously help our group do an absolutely massive amount of damage. We spam corpses, we drop skills, we keep our uptimes, we keep procking everything that we've got going on, and we're just able to give a huge amount, huge amount of benefit to our group. If we've got a group that's not so, so good with damage, it's fine because then we can provide other things. We can provide something else 
when we start using things um, like the the resolve. We can start resurrecting group members if they're down, which is another nice option. So yeah, there you go, guys. This this is basically how you run the build. You just you just stand there, maintain your skills, just keep everything running. Make sure you're procking everything. Drake's Rush, Arcasis. Spam your corpses, consume the corpses, and drop your ult as soon as you get it. And it's that simple. It, it might look a bit complicated, because obviously you are doing, you are very active. This does require you to be quite actively casting skills. But it's, it's not as difficult as it seems, because if you're on a boss fight, for example, this is absolutely fantastic. In terms of being in a ad fight, obviously it's a little bit more tricky because you can't rotate through this many skills in an ad fight. However, you won't need to cast all of the corpse creating skills in an ad fight because you'll already have corpses from the actual ads that you're killing. Um, and that, yeah, we didn't even have pearls proc in there. That, that was without pearls procs because we're not even in a, an intense situation where we're needing to block or use up any stamina or anything like that. So we weren't even getting the procs um, of the Pearls of Elna face. So they would be uh, added in as well later down the line. Like within, when you're doing damage, when you're in a dungeon, you are going to be blocking more. You are going to be losing stamina. Uh, so that is going to proc as well. Yeah, the ulti gen setup on a Necro tank is just a really fun way to play a Necro tank for like four man content. Obviously, this isn't really, this isn't viable for trials. This isn't a trial build. Uh, I guess normal trials, yeah. You could use it in normal trials, but in terms of vet trials, you would not be able to use this kind of build in a vet trial. But as you can see, the whole point of the build is to generate ultimate ridiculously fast. And we're able to do that really, really easily. So so guys, that is the, the Soul Eater Necromancer tank build. If you want to see more, like I say, you can check this out on the website. I'll have this updated this week. So just go and have a little look on there and, uh, and put it together for yourself and see how it does.